they can't tell what's a way. No, let them know they can't tell what's a way. Hey, no one is disposable. Let them know they can't tell what's a way. No, let them know they can't tell what's a way. No, let them know they can't tell what's a way. Hey, no one is disposable. COVID and climate change ain't far from the same. People in the margins disrespected and blamed. They put oil and gas infrastructures where we play. Contaminate the lands, air and the rain. Our health in a game, our lungs are inflamed. Stuck in a cage with a severe corona case. Displaced by the climate while they profit from our pain. But I don't see them treating their children the same way. Hey, they try to bury me, but don't know I'm a seed. We are seeds, they see same flow, but she have no ID. No one is disposable, we are capable. Rooted like a vegetable and taking back the time to give it to my people. Want everything equal, no government's free throw. We know how to water the roots. Need no politician telling us how to do it. Need no politician telling us how to Let do it. Let them know they can't throw us away. No. Let them know they can't throw us away. No. Let them know they can't throw us away. Hey. No one is disposable. Let them know they can't throw us away. No. Let them know they can't throw us away. No. Let them know they can't throw us away. Hey. No one is disposable. Uh, Trying to bury us. Didn't know we were seeds. Frighten us. Expecting us to retreat. Recede. Fall back. Shut up, sit down, we rooted here and breaking ground Concrete roses and dandelions come summertime We fly the wind with wishes of our family riding Rising high, carry them up to God's ears Divine beings, we know that God hears See the system writhing, crying, fighting for its last dying breath It rather pillage till it's nothing left And paradigm shift to the left Like sharing wealth will be the kiss of death Well, I got a news flash for you folks Our youth are ravenous savages and they ain't gonna take no more So kiss your billions to sleep tonight Cause come morning time, we gonna retrieve our birthright Let them know they can't throw us away, no Let them know they can't throw us away, no Let them know they can't throw us away, no. Let them know they can't throw us away. Hey. No one is disposable. Let them know they can't throw what's away. No. Let them know they can't throw what's away. No. Let them know they can't throw what's away. Hey. No one is disposable. Burning bright with hope and love. Sexism, racism, they throw at us. You can throw us into dirt and darkness, but just like a plant, we grow through the soil and towards the light. Controlling us as if we are property. Though they try to change us, we are unbreakable. You have forgotten what happens when we unite. Together we are strongest and we will fight. We need a livable future and not just for the wealthy. They look at us with greed-filled eyes, afraid of our strength. The toxic pollution you dump into the air is like poison and makes us all unhealthy. I'm fighting for my sisters and brothers in Mother Earth. I'm sorry that you have forgotten her work. It depends on our people understanding how important our voices and thoughts are. Because unlike before, we refuse to be silenced. I'm fighting for a world where people will be prioritized over profit. A world where we no longer have to fear poverty, immigration, white supremacy, racism, sexism, homophobia, and other truly ugly things in this truly beautiful world. I stand with those who continue to be systematically silent and whose presence seems to be dismissed. For those who have been here for centuries long before us and continue to be exploited and misrepresented. I stand with the indigenous leaders who are filled with knowledge but are constantly mistakenly spoken for. Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. The slide that you are viewing in this moment um, includes a flyer for tonight's event, as well as the YouTube cover image of tonight's intro music, No One is Disposable by Youth Versus Apocalypse. Thank you so much for joining our fourth webinar of our Lessons in Liberation series, Students for Abolition. My name is Farima. My pronouns are she and her. I have brown skin and dark curly hair. I'm wearing a black sweater with violet letters that read abolish prison. I am a former elementary teacher who is now a professor of teacher education at the University of San Francisco. And I'm also a grassroots local and national organizer and one of the members of the Lessons in Liberation editorial collective. 
such an honor to share space with y'all. Just asking that we breathe as we enter into this space. So I'm going to ask that we go on to the next slide. And before we begin, we'd like to just take care of some housekeeping. The slide we have up is white with blue, green, and orange circles and highlights the following housekeeping items. We have our Q&A function enabled in the Zoom, but please note there won't be a Q&A period. Please only use the Q&A feature to raise accessibility or technical issues. We will invite your engagement via the Padlet. We will continue to share the Padlet link and pin it in the Q&A. And CART captions are available in our Zoom webinar or can also be accessed via a live stream. So you can use the QR code to access the captions. And we will also pin the link in the Q&A as well. So today we are gathering to celebrate the release of Lessons in Liberation, a multimedia toolkit that documents how educators, young people, organizers, and communities are building and practicing abolition in their schools and in their neighborhoods. This toolkit is the product of years of collaboration between the Education for Liberation Network and Critical Resistance with multiple other affiliated organizations, including the ones being shared in the chat. This slide includes headshots of some of the core members of our editorial collective, Chrissy A.Z. Hernandez, Erica R. Miners, myself, Farima Porchid, um, our dear and beloved Thomas Nikundiwe, may he rest in power, Sefatni Tapdom, Corey Green, Alex Davis, who's also one of our panelists tonight, Stefan Shack Bellevue, Emily Bautista, and Emily Borg, who's helping us with tech tonight as well, and the AK Press logo. Beyond this beautiful toolkit in print, we are also still developing the accompanying Lessons and Liberation website and a discussion guide, which will be coming soon. So I'll go ahead and now pass it over to my good friend and comrade, David Snowball. Hey, hey, what's going on, everybody? My name is Dave Stovall. I am a Black man with brown skin. Uh, long gray and brown locks. I've been working with young folks and families for the last 30 years around education and housing and abolishing the school prison nexus. I'm also a professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago, where I am in the departments of Black Studies and also in the Department of Criminology, Law and Justice. So we have a slide up with the cover of Lessons in Liberation on a white magenta, lavender, and yellow background with black text that reads available at akpress.org and the QR code. The cover depicts a person with a dark brown skin, a short brown Afro hairstyle, black sunglasses, magenta sweater, blue pants, and a prosthetic limb, limb who is gardening. A young person with brown skin and black braided shoulder length hair is kneeling at the foot of the garden bed, tending the soil. Behind them, people are working on a mural that depicts activists with megaphones and fists raised in bright yellows and oranges. While we celebrate the release of Lessons in Liberation, we want to recognize the tremendous anti racial res and resilience of educators during this time including classroom teachers, paraeducators, community educators, teacher educators, parents, aunties, uncles, siblings, community members, youth and neighbors who have been creating spaces for liberatory learning, even for these un unprecedented circumstances, as well as those with a new commitment to engaging in this current work. We also know that many viewers involved are involved in active campaigns around abolition in schools. So we encourage you to use the hashtag lessons in liberation on social media and the lessons is capitalized, N is capitalized and then liberation is capital with a capital L. So it's capital L lessons, capital I and capital L liberation 
on social media to share any resources, campaign information, URLs for organizers, reports, posters, and flyers. Today, we're coming together to reflect with our comrades around what it means to be returning back to school in this political and unprecedented moment about why abolition is important to consider in relation to preschool 12th grade education, what tensions arise when bridging abolition and education, and most importantly, what possibilities are available to us when we engage abolitionist teaching and organizing in and outside of schools. If you have the means, please consider supporting us by making a donation to Education for Liberation Network or to Critical Resistance. Your donations help this work, help make this work possible. And now I'm going to pass it over to Farima for our land acknowledgement and the grounding of this event. Thank you so much. So, so we just want to also acknowledge the stolen, occupied, unceded native land that each of us are joining this call from. And we just ask that you also take a moment to acknowledge mm -hmm. the indigenous name of the land that you are on. I am joining this call from Serrano lands that is currently known as Yucca Valley. And if you do not know what indigenous land that you are on, there's a phone app and a website called native-land that will help you to locate the name of indigenous land anywhere that you go so that you can continue to show recognition and reverence to any uh, occupied land that you are on. The website URL will be in the chat and I will spell it out now. It is H-T-T-P-S colon, forward slash, forward slash, native, N as in Nancy, A-T-I-V-E dash L-A-N-D dot C-A forward slash. We know that our work must always go beyond words and that we must act in solidarity with all First Nations who are working to protect their land and people. And so in collaboration with this land acknowledgement, we ask that you also join us in committing to take action, to be in solidarity with all native people wherever they are. Um, and as you can see, the background of the slide that we have up is white with an outline of a world map in gray. The title of the slide is Actionable Land Acknowledgement. And there are three square graphs, the logo of the Sangorite Land Trust, the back profile of a woman with two long braids wearing a t-shirt that says rematriate the land and a QR code. As the text on the slide reads, we can support rematriation and indigenous organizing in our community locally with a donation, or we can invite you to give to the Sangorte Land Trust to support their work on returning indigenous lands to indigenous people. The URL will be in the chat and it is also spelled HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash S-O-G-O-R E-A-T-E dash L-A-N-D-T-R-U-S-T dot O-R-G slash D-O-N-A-T-E slash. And so I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to my comrade Stovall. Thanks again. So thanks again to our panelists, Alex Altoro and Guillaume. Caleb Bakari Altman and Jaquela Williams Foster. This slide shows the headshots and names of our panelists and they will provide a self introduction of themselves shortly. Also, we wanna give a special shout out and thank you in advance to our interpretation team. Please join me in thanking the interpretation team, Joe Toledo, Aaron Sanders Sigmon, Cameron King and William Mendez Gallardo to Corey Dotsey for providing uh, card captions and to all of you taking the time to be present online today. So I will let uh, Alex Altoro and Anne Guillaume, Guillaume introduce themselves. We have bios, but I just wanted to make sure that they have an opportunity to introduce themselves and then Farima will introduce our second panelist who will also introduce those.
We can go um, and start with Alex. There we go. Thank you. Everyone hear me? Appreciate it. Yep. I am Alex Davis. Uh, they, them, he, Al Toro. Uh, I want to acknowledge that I am on Lenape indigenous land. I am a black person with brown skin. I'm wearing a gray designer do-rag um, and a gray zipper sweater that says holla, how our lives link all together. Uh, my background has white walls uh, with a window ceiling with uh, a picture, an incense burner, uh, and a painting to my left with a garden. Uh, you know, uh, I'm from, you know, Hala, High Lives Link All Together, which is a grassroots community-based organization in New York City, um, which was founded in prison in 2007 by seven black men. Uh, Hala teaches a non-traditional approach to healing-centered youth development. Uh, we work with black, brown, and indigenous uh, youth in communities that are impacted by community um, systematic and interpersonal relationship violence. Uh, through that, we really provide healing circles for transformation. Um, we provide educational um, curriculum um, and technical assistance for um, community spaces and organizations, um, and also do a lot of deep healing with ourselves internally and with our families um, through taking various um, trips and um, taking ourselves to different spaces where we can learn about our history. Uh, we see our work uh, is inspired by abolition uh, through uh, the legacy we stand on, which is African sacred science, indigenous and ancestral wisdom of cosmology and rituals as a way to build ourselves in our community um, and to impact our society um, as, uh, through Pan-Africanism. Uh, we also stand on our family's uh, legacy and wisdom um, from Mississippi, uh, Honduras, Haiti, Jamaica, Puerto Rico, um, our mothers and grandmothers who have been living and surviving and resisting the war that is on black and brown people. Uh, uh, we stand on grassroots movement work um, the Black Seminoles, the Gullah Geechee people who led the largest slave rebellion in uh, 1739, uh, Denmark Vesey, Nat Turner, Harriet Tubman, uh, and many more of our ancestors and elders um, who uh, resisted and did the work. Uh, we also stand on prison organizing. Uh, our uh, Eddie Ellis, uh, who formed the, uh, and founded the Center for New Leadership on Urban Solutions, uh, which was a leader and organizer in the Attica Uprising, um, who was also a part of the Greenhaven Think Tank that resulted in the Seven Neighborhood Study, um, and as well as uh, Hill and Justice, which we use as a tool um, and praxis that is from our ancestors and elders, such as Kara Page, Son Jim Wright, um, and many more others. Hello everyone, my name is Anne Guillaume. I go by she, they. Um, I'm acknowledging that I'm on Ohlone land and I'm from Richmond, California. And I, if y'all, some for some that don't see me, um, I'm a Southeast Asian with deep skin, dark, semi-wavy long hair. Um, I'm wearing a silver necklace, a black shirt that reads resist in all caps and with, I'm also wearing a deep beige, almost brown cardigan. And my background is just a blank wall. Um, to further introduce myself, um, again, I'm from Richmond, California. I'm with the Rice Youth Center. And as I, um, when I started at being at Rice, I was 16 um, through a leadership pipeline that 
from a fellow, I mean, an intern to a fellow. And now I'm the youth organizing program assistant here at RISE Commons or RISE Center. And I center radical organizing um, for social justice issues and expressing through leadership and diligence through community engagement, youth power advocacy, artivism, such as writing, visual art and other things. And I also fight against displacement and all with love and solidarity. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna go ahead and ask um, that our other two panelists, Kayla Bakari Otman, as well as Jaquela Williams Foster, after him, um, uh, describe and introduce themselves and their work as well. Thank you. What's up, y'all? My name is Caleb Ottman. Um, I am a Black um, non-binary man. I am from the west side of Chicago. I have tan skin, lots braided down to my back, and a orange, a bright orange hoodie on. Um, my background is the lovely dorm of UW-Madison. Uh, where I am currently studying legal studies and sociology. Um, I am on Ho-Chunk land uh, here in Madison um, and back home in Chicago. I reside on Potawatomi land, Ojibwe land, Miami land. Um, and yeah, uh, I'm excited to be here. I just wanna thank everyone for having me and having uh, the rest of the panelists on. Um, I think that abolition for me right now means uh, dreaming of worlds not yet born or formed. Um, I think abolition is the process of deep self-care and care work. Um, I think that abolition is the only compass we have uh, or one of the only compass, compasses that we have um, for the future. Um, I'm humbled to be a student of abolition. I'm humbled to be around so many and learn from so many um, abolitionists through their work, through their writings, through their words and their action and being. Um, I think that abolition is, the, is not only a process, not only a product, but also it's a practice. Um, it is a paradigm that we look at the world through. Um, it, it, it's possibility, that's all I can say. Um, I think that the way I look at abolition is not just the tearing down of things, um, but letting some things that need to die, die in order to nourish new life. Um, so I think about abolition as birth. Um, I think about it as resurrection. Um, and yeah, I stand on the ancestors and elders of black radical queer feminists, um, undocumented folk, environmentalists, indigenous folk, educators um, who have really not only poured into my life, um, but the lives of so many I love and our lives, this work. Um, yeah, I, I'm thankful to be here and I can't wait to dig in more. Hello everyone, my name is Ja'Kayla Foster. I am 22 years old, currently residing within the Bay Area, specifically Oakland, California. My background is unnecessarily dark. Um, I have terrible camera quality for some odd reason. I am currently wearing a yellow headband and a hoodie that says, what way that way? It's actually a hoodie that I created with my youth that I work with in promotion of a summit that they put together. And the what way is just a catchy thing for them to say that way, which is what in Project What. Um, I am an African-American female. I have dark brown skin. I have a lovely gap in between the two front of my teeth. 
And yes, I am encouraging other people on a day-to-day basis to not only listen to young people, but to also put their voices at the forefront when it comes to talking about prison abolition. For that reason, my reasoning for that is because I truly believe and feel that young people do not feel as though they have a role when it comes to the fight against mass incarceration and the end result, which would be the abolition of the prison industrial complex. I am solely a transformative thinker because I myself used to be a young person within my program. And I believe that incarceration was not only normal, but it was something that we could not, um, something we couldn't prevent from happening. I was basically told to believe that since incarceration was so widely spread throughout my community that it was something in itself that we had no control over. And I do the work that I do in order to continue to educate young people in addition to people within my own age group so that we know that this is something that we not only have to tackle, but something that we need to make sure no longer continues to harm our communities and harm us as individuals, whether it's personally or through our loved ones. Thank you so All right. much. All right, there we go. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with our discussion. And the order of speakers for this question, oh, they're asking me to start my video. So the order of speakers for this session will be Jaquela, Caleb, Anne, and Alex. And so I'll say that again, Jaquela, Caleb, and Alex. And the question that we have for you all is, can you talk about your work in activism and how it's been inspired by abolition? You all alluded to it a little bit in your introductions, but if you all can go specifically into your work in activism and then how it's been inspired by abolition. We can go ahead and start off with you, Jaquela. Thank you very much, Dave. So my work within ab- activism actually started once I was a young person. I believe I was around the age of 15 and I was introduced into the program of Project What. As I mentioned earlier, Project What is a program for youth whose parents are or formerly were incarcerated within some point of their lifetime. I myself have had um, the experience of parental incarceration. My father was incarcerated multiple times throughout my life. And I felt like that was something I had to keep to myself and something that I also feel like I played a role into being for the simple fact that it was my father and I was the child of someone who was currently incarcerated. Um, I was introduced into a project what by a best friend of mine who was already currently in the program. Her father also has been incarcerated continuously throughout her childhood and just her lifetime in general. She was a part of the program and she took me to an event that they were hosting. And when I say they were hosting, I'm speaking about the actual young people who were in the program were running an entire event. And when I say young people, these youth were between the ages of I want to say 14 and 17. No one was older than 17. No one was younger than 14. And it just felt really great for me to see these people who were combined together or joined together because of a trauma, which is having your parent incarcerated. But they were using this experience as a reason to go into their communities and to educate others about their experiences and why other young people shouldn't be experiencing the things that we all do experience as a result of our parent being incarcerated. That just snowballed into our own personal passion for talking about parental incarceration and talking about the improvements that needs to be made for young people who are experiencing parental incarceration. I myself am the oldest of three, and every time my father was incarcerated, I felt as though it was my responsibility to take up on that parent role that was now essentially empty 
And I became an adult at a young age. So I didn't really see activism as a thing. I just knew that I needed to figure out how to make money and help take care of myself and my siblings. Once I joined Project What, they put me through a training to where they helped me analyze my actual feelings and the things that I feel when it comes to incarceration and particularly my role within mass incarceration in the prison industrial complex. I used to hate going to see my parent in prisons or jails because the visitation rooms were just completely horrible. We had people watching us all of the time. There was always some kind of something. I, when I was younger, I don't know what it was, either blood or something. It was always gunk on the floors, on the chairs. And it didn't seem like anybody necessarily really wanted us to be there to visit our loved one who was currently incarcerated. Everything within my experience when it comes to the prison industrial complex and also when it comes to law enforcement has not been the best. Although I do still feel like my experiences alongside with positive experiences are necessary in order for us to continue to go out and get people to understand that abolition is ultimately the end goal, or at least for me and my young people, that's ultimately the end goal because there have been communities that have been dealing with these experiences or similar experiences, lack of resources, lack of education, lack of just freedom in general prior to the prison industrial complex even existed. And I feel like those communities were able to come together and figure out solutions, come together and appoint people to be the ones to make the harder decisions, if that was even a thing. And I just feel like we've become very much so used to the norm or the normity of there being a prison or a jail and that quote unquote bad people, or if you do this, you end up in here. When in real, realistically speaking, that was not always a thing. And it became a thing once we um, were told to live a certain way. And that's something that I use with talking with my youth and educating my youth on the history of incarceration, but not just that, but just the history of people coming into different lands and making their own way of living and doing whatever it is that they can to make it seem like that's the only way that we should and are going to live unless people decide to act against it. Definitely, thank you so much. Caleb. What's up? Um, yeah, so I uh, like to consider or see myself as a, a child of the movement. Um, I started organizing when I was 12 years old in Chicago. Um, our first action, we marched from our school, uh, Village Leadership Academy, uh, to the Juvenile Temporary Detention Center that borders um, our community, the west side of Chicago. Um, and it's actually one of the largest like detention centers for young people, uh, prisons um, for young people, I'm sorry, um, in, in the nation. Um, and I remember that night um, feeling powerful, feeling heard, um, feeling in community with folk as we march through the dead snow of Chicago winter um, to, to show up not only for the folk locked inside because they started banging on the windows and they started screaming and they started uh, fogging the windows and drawing hearts and uh, uh, we just got louder and uh, more connected through um, through this this barrier, through this this thing that was supposed to destroy that bond, and still seeing that resistance um, is possible um, through that lens. And I remember just feeling powerful, but also feeling like I needed to do more. Um, I've already was around some folk at Village Leadership Academy um, who. Um, which was founded by black women um, who saw a need uh, for the for education, social justice founded and based education um, for black and brown kids on the west and south sides of Chicago. So they pulled their heads together um, and they started a daycare, which I started at and that daycare eventually led into a school. Um, and here these black women, um, took young black kids from the west and south sides of Chicago, taught them about our history, taught us about our resistance, um, 
showed us a path in which we can be contributors to history and to the world and to the making of a new world um, and built that in the curriculum, built that in the day-to-day -day interaction and engagement with us, um, poured so much into us and saw our brilliance. Um, that's what inspires me about abolition is this making of our being, our bodies, our, our communities in spite of what is happening and what, what is made to destroy us. Um, so my, my work grows out of that. I'm an organizer um, based around youth incarceration, um, food injustices, um, and, and the school to prison pipeline as well. Um, I see my work in, as really a way of just trying to feed and save as many folk as I can in the process of saving myself. I think that abolition is the process of sitting with each other as we live in ourselves. Um, it's saying how can we all show up hopefully to this work and for ourselves and like how do we live with each other in that and hold each, each other accountable to that. Uh, so I use abolition in my photography and filmmaking and my cooking um, and my poetry and my writing. Um, so I think that abolition is it's, it's a lifestyle. Um, it's, a, it's a DNA element that I think many folk who are at the margins already have within our, our bodies and our bones. Um, and it just takes us um, being committed to that work to fester out and like tweet out um, what's there. So, yeah. Definitely. Thank you for that. And we go ahead and join us in the discussion. Sure. Thank you. Um, well, starting this work, um, it definitely took me time to name what um, I am as an organizer, but Starting, I never really considered myself as an activist or an organizer in my community at first. Um, well, mainly because like I didn't feel the need to name all that um, in order to do the work that I do. Um, and my form of activism definitely comes in different forms. Uh, there's youth activism, artivism, writing, um, social and environmental activism. And I definitely do my best to incorporate them and share them all in one. Um, and a lot of action that I have been involved in within my community um, has extended and showed what activism can look and sound and feel like. Um, and being part of those movements definitely made me crave more action to fight for issues and break down systems that continue to harm and um, give injustices. Um, and starting from that, like during my internship here at RISE, I was able to step into roles that tied into a lot of student advocacy um, by representing my high school um, and RISE itself in the district local control ac accountability plan for students and parents. Um, within that committee, I had the chance to dive into um, a lot of the details on like how to, um, like getting involved in the process of how things go within the district and definitely got a chance to observe how students are being supported and served and how all the process goes. And being in that committee definitely reminded me of how much of what is planned for students um, actually lack a lot of student voices, which is ironic. And besides from like the representatives themselves, there are no other students that are um, serving their voices and being um, in a table to decide these plans, right? Um, and some of the budgets that were allocated towards the, um, towards, allocated towards schools um, were actually impacting students of color more. And being exposed to that um, motivated me to become a better student advocate by continuing to know how to dismantle and even replenish and um, heal from that and 
in the summer, I had the opportunity to co-facilitate a youth cohort um, called Richmond Youth for Abolition. Um, and within those weeks, I was honored to work with youth leaders who were interested in abolition work, um, learning um, how to honor the work and be with youth leaders that were becoming their abolitionists themselves and emphasizing their own experiences and their schools, families, and their communities um, to lean towards abolition. Um, and while facil facilitating this cohort, um, I was able to like learn about the core values of abolition, um, learning about the history of Richmond and the roots and uh, just being able to acknowledge that the culture and the art and the healing of Richmond and everyone else around me has a lot of resilience in it. And as I mostly work with youth and as a youth organizer myself, I'm still definitely navigating and exploring how I can show up as myself as an abolitionist, not only for others. Um, and I continue to remind myself that um, others and others when I get a chance to, um, that in our daily lives, uh, um, small aspects involve a system um, or will be tied to a system. And only you have the power to not let that um, hold you. And I believe a huge part of this work is knowing about the parts of yourself and talking about myself, like how, what, I, what do I need to decolonize and work on? And in order for me to pass those methods and provide support and the love and the care for the youth that I work with, um, also touching on like the deep ends of youth activism, it is not just about the chaos and being in the uncomfortable situations or, co or conversations. Um, it's definitely deeper than that and holding space for them. Um, it's about listening and demanding, um, storytelling and speaking out with all resilience and solidarity in the best ways that you can and I can for my community as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Anne. Brother Altoto. I appreciate that, thank you. Hey, Alex here again. Um, so, you know, my journey, um, you know, becoming an organizer, activist, uh, was definitely a process, um, you know, going through the system, being on seven years probation, uh, being able to get like teaching mentorship and, and, and leadership from the Center for New Leadership on Urban Solution. Um, and then being able to like meet up with uh, Hala, 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 Link all together, uh, which really, you know, put me in a another transformation um, to really commit myself to uh, community grassroots organizing uh, and doing that abolition work. And through that process, uh, we was really building relationships with each other. Um, and really learning about our history uh, and learning about, uh, about you know, organizers who, who, who were socially conscious people in prison who was doing work like the Young Lords and the Black Panthers um, and the Green Haven Think Tank and the Bedford Hill Sisters. Uh, and then really through that process, uh, you know, we wanted to go outside. We wanted to do healing work um, because we know we needed healing. Uh, and through that, we, you know, started creating curriculum, which was really centered on, um, you know, asking folks, um, you know, you know, what, what does harm look like? Um, you know, what does healing look like in our lives? Um, and having individual and large dialogues um, through certain questions that can engage us um, and really being vulnerable. Because uh, through healing, we started to understand that uh, healing is really a, a, a two-way street where, you know, uh, where, where, where healing from uh, internal, internally through, through, uh, through practices from, uh, from our ancestors and elders, but also, uh, you know, doing all the work collectively which is also doing a lot of healing with each other to build all of our leadership with each other. Um, and this was really, you know, as young people, 
um, come together from, you know, different neighborhoods in New York and really from the seven neighborhoods in New York that, um, that are feeding 75% of the prison system in New York State. Um, and that is Brownsville, Best-Eye, uh, Harlem, East New York, uh, Jamaica, Queens, and South Bronx, uh, and Lower East Side. Uh, and really through uh, our movement, which we were saying like we're doing a Hill and Justice movement, which was like I said before, is was standing on the legacies of, of grassroots movements that have already been going on. Uh, so when we think about, um, you know, our abolition work is inspired uh, by Malcolm X, it's inspired by the Young Lords, by the Black Panthers, uh, uh, by the uh, Greensboro Four, because we understand that uh, um, our work has always been led by youth leadership. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Kayla. Um, thank you, Ja'Kayla. Each of you shared so much important information um, with each of us to understand what brought you into this work of abolition and how you kind of enter in through your work. And what I hear so clearly amongst all of y'all is that it really started with self. Like y'all came in with an experience that was deeply and intimately connected to the conditions of um, the prison industrial complex, right? And using that experience as um, being what is most central to your knowledge, right? To your wisdom, to how you come into this work. And I thought it was so powerful to really start with your stories. So thank you so much for that. And with that said, as I was listening to y'all speak about just the amazing work that you are doing, whether it is collective healing spaces, whether it is advocacy work, um, whether it is peer education and really creating a deeper awareness, what I see is that there's so much power in centering youth in these conversations and in these movements. In fact, we come from a lineage of that, right? So why is it important for youth um, and young folks to be at the forefront of abolitionist organizing in education specifically. And I would love to hear from our speakers in the following order, if that's cool, Caleb and Alex, and then Ja'Kayla. And for our listeners, I'm gonna go ahead and put a link to our Padlet. If you are hearing things that you wanna capture and you wanna make sure that you are um, having a place to go back to, I'm gonna put that link in the chat now as you hear some more brilliance from Caleb and Alex and Ja'Kayla. So go ahead, Kayla. Word, thank you so much for that. And I uh, just wanna snaps for all of the um, comments y'all have heard thus far. I think that young people um, are the future, I guess. I know that's uh, so cliche to say, but um, young folk really have the ability um, when, when guided by their elders and their comrades, um, have the ability of bringing freshness to the work. Um, they have the ability of physically continuing the work. Um, I think about Mary Hook's mandate for black people. Um, and it's a part where, which I, I'm paraphrasing um, is that like, we're about to, we do this work to avenge the suffering of our ancestors, but also to earn the respect of future generations, right? Um, so we don't do this work um, as a way of like, preserving ourselves and like our freedoms. We, we do this work because we know that we may never see true freedom um, and that we just have to carry the baton, our leg of the race and pass that on. So young folk are really um, core, essential uh, to movement, energy, spaces, and the continuum of, uh, of the freedom project. Um, I think about the history of young people, right? Um, we can go back to enslavement where young bodies 
were literally running off plantations as forms of resistance. Um, I think about the teaching of black children, um, um, both legally and illegally, um, post emancipation um, and during during enslavement, um, and how that was a way of of freedom dreaming and saying that no, we need to do better by you so that you can do better by the next generation. And step by step, together we're going to get over this line of freedom. Um, I think about um, the 1919 Red Summers all across the nation. Um, and here in Chicago, a black boy drowning in Lake Michigan um, after his body uh, received the blows of, of rocks by uh, white, uh, white boys just joking and trying to, 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 to maim his body. Um, so yeah, I think about all of that. And then you can go to the civil rights movement when you talk about the children's crusade of 1963, when you talk about the uprisings after um, the uh, MLK uh, riots, young people have always been at the forefront um, and have led movements and resistance and abolitionist uh, uh, movements since there have been um, any. So I think that young people um, should be at the forefront because the movement is not a movement without it because you need the energy, you need the youngness, the freshness, the gas um, to move. And, and, and young people have that energy um, and they have that, not only that energy, but young people are also really, um, I'm finding out more and more really deeply committed to this work in ways that is not just um, superficial. Young folk are doing the readings, they're asking the hard questions, they're doing the work on top of balancing um, uh, other labor res responsibilities that uh, people may overlook because of young people, right? Think about what young people contribute in your household. Um, and then let's also have that conversation about what young people should be contributing uh, to movement spaces and how adult allies and our elders need to be there to support that. Um, so yeah, that's what I think about young people um, being at the forefront of abolitionist organizing and education and movement spaces. So much goodness there. Um, we're gonna go ahead and pass it to Anne. Thank you, Fari. Um, yeah, so, I mean, <clears throat> we all know like young people already have the core knowledge and like tools um, within themselves to know um, what is needed and what is definitely not needed. Um, and they're the ones that are impacted and going through these challenges on a daily basis, they know what actually what they want for themselves and um, within their schools and their own communities. Um, it's their education and lives that is fully impacted. And even in the deep ends, like there are, there are things that come with it that not everybody sees. And young people have the power to dismantle those systems little by little, but always with a stronger approach every single time um, by showing up, sharing their stories and being advocates for other causes. Um, and after breaking down those systems, we definitely need to reimagine with youth and after the impact, like what can we do and what can we provide for youth um, to further support them with their needs and wants in life um, to further flourish and just give more spaces and resources that needs to be opened up for these youth. Um, to have that support and transformative healing in their own pace and while knowing what else they, while knowing or getting to know what they want for themselves. Um, for example, like we need like listening sessions and definitely dissect them, um, being able to dissect the educational system, um, such as a district, like learning about who's in a student council and who can support them with their requests and needs for their schools. Um, supporting them with finding their allies and connecting and definitely getting involved in, uh, in, me in unmeasurable ways that in their own ways, kind of like how I mentioned earlier, how um, 
it's not always just um, speaking and having uncomfortable conversations with older folks, but definitely um, having that conversations um, within their own um, fellow youth um, allies that they can discuss these issues about and knowing what their needs are. Um, so yeah, that's definitely why like young people should definitely be in the forefront because they know what they want and they got all the tools within themselves. Um, and yeah, it's definitely just all about listening and um, holding space for our youth. Mm, mm. Nah, thank you for that. Dua, dua, dua. I said, Alex here again. Um, just want to, you know, piggyback off, you know, my other comrades that was uh, talking. Um, and, you know, we need to stand on the legacy that uh, youth has always been at the forefront of movement organizing in their communities for liberation. Um, and I think it's because of, you know, white supremacy uh, that within like organizing activism, advocacy, and even abolition um, that we're being pushed into like, you know, silencing youth in spaces or certain silos and, you know, or having our work in silos where youth are not in the tables of like leadership. Um, and then we have to stand on the lessons of like youth led groups like Caleb was talking about, um, like SNCC, CORE, um, the Greensboro Four, uh, the Young Lords, Black Panthers, the Ghetto Brothers, um, all these uh, spaces and, 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 and community organizers was teaching us and showing us the, the actual role of youth uh, leadership. Um, and for us in HALA, we really believe that culture is our education. Uh, one of my brothers, <laughs> Corey, uh, has that line um, in, in one of uh, his poems. Um, but what we think about that is, um, and I'm gonna use one of our initiatives that uh, we've been um, leading and engaging in, which is our legacy tour which is connected to us regaining and reimagining and, and learning history. Um, also, you know, creating a, a museum where we could have learned lessons of, of youth organizing um, and, and elder leadership, um, but also centering our learning in Afro-centered um, worldview um, and Pan-Africanism. Uh, so through this like tour, you know, we've been, you know, traveling, um, you know, went to Kemet, Africa, uh, went to see Nat Turner. Um, and then also, you know, we just recently went to North Carolina um, and all these trips, you know, where we're taking um, our families, our young people. Um, and on our trip to North Carolina, uh, you know, and, and, and teaching about um, the Gullah Geechee people uh, and, and the rebellion of 1739. A lot of our young people, like my nephew, our sons, um, um, were saying that like, yo, you know, we don't learn this in our schools. This education isn't given in our schools. And, and that in our schools, um, you know, what we're learning isn't gravitated in our ancestral spirit, in our wisdom, in our knowledge, in our history, in our blackness. Um, and uh, when we think about uh, the reason why, you know, you know, we're going against, uh, we're doing abolition and going against even the educational system uh, is because just like you thinking like, you know, our young people isn't getting a certain kind of education, um, and at a certain age period, that's also our moms, our grandmoms. We got to think about like our elders who also like were like they wasn't getting that, and so the young people was fighting for that. I'm fighting for my moms who ain't get that, and my grandmother who ain't get that education. You understand? And so uh, it's important that um, that the young people is at the forefront because they have the extra umph and the energy and the persistence, and also um, they're also going to our teachers. 
that you know our, our, our educators, our, our, which are our moms, our, our our other activists and um, organizers. So you know they're using that as our teachers, as as a way to like strengthen their leadership and organizing. Um, and so, like I was saying, like you know, culture is our education, and being able to express ourselves through our history, our ancestry, our art, our creativity is abolition. Doing healing is abolition. Um, and young people uh, really exemplify that in their everyday basis of just trying to live. Ooh, you said so much there. Thank you, Alex. And now we're gonna move it on to Ja'Kayla. Thank you. Just to give a quick little Disclaimer, I do have three puppies and they have been very loud for the past few minutes. I got them to be quiet. Um, so my apologies if they get loud again. And my answer to this question is I actually really enjoy being asked this question because I feel like young people aren't always thought about when it comes to just pushing a message forward in general or looking forward to something as big as abolition. I feel like it's very essential for young people to be at the forefront and also for them to be the ones deciding where we go from here because they are the people who are experiencing the impacts the most and they still have a lot more to go through. They still have a lot more that they need to be able to decipher between decipher through without having an adult or multiple adults there telling them what we feel like they should be doing or telling them what we feel like is such a big issue at this point in time. In addition to that, there's very rarely that you're going to meet a young person or at least in my experience where I've met a young person that didn't already know what they wanted in some form when it comes to a future or when it comes to them looking towards how they see society being few years after or way after we're even gone. And I feel like young people just aren't giving the opportunities to actually be vocal and to vocalize what it is the change that they want to see and how they want things to be changed. Because young, the young people that I work with in particular, they rarely ever come with a problem without a solution. Anytime they have an issue with something, they also come to myself or my manager with the information that they feel like would better it or prevent that from happening to a peer of the, that they have moving forward within life. Also, when it comes to abolition, I feel like that's something that it has to be young people, similar to what Alex and Ann and others said, and Caleb said also is that if you look back in the history, a lot of these huge movements against authority or against the prison industrial complex has been by a, a group of younger people, a group of people who weren't necessarily just letting stuff slide. They get tired of dealing with the conditions that we've dealt with. They get tired of dealing with the conditions that the people before us have dealt with, and they know exactly what it is that they want. And I feel like it's gonna be a trial and error, of course, with anybody who's trying to do this work that we've been doing. I feel like it just makes more sense for us to do the trial and error process with the youth at the forefront because they are with the fresh ideas. They are coming through with information that we as adults and we as older people who have gone through our own personal experiences may not be so keen to or may not be paying as much attention to being as though we do have years of experiences and years of things that we are using ourselves to develop our own toolkits when we're doing the work that we're doing. So young people need to be at the forefront because their voices are fresh, their voices need to be heard and their ideas are gonna benefit us in addition to them because they're seeing the total impact of all of the decisions that have been made prior to them. Definitely, thanks. Thanks for that y'all and thank Thank you all for putting us in an understanding about what it means to do the work in a way and to really, what I'm hearing for you all is to rethink inclusion, right? This idea around putting folks who have been marginalized into the forefront and then remembering movement work. So let's go on to 
our next question. And the order, this order will go Alex and Jaquela and then Caleb. And the question is, what advice would you give young people who are interested in getting involved in activism or who are already involved in activism? And what advice would you give to educators and activists who are interested in organizing with you? So for people who are, what would you say for people who are want to get involved and who are already involved? And then what would you want to say to educators and activists who are interested in organizing with, with young people? Thank you. So definitely, uh, Alex here again, thank you. Uh, the advice I would give to young people, uh, I feel like I have, have many. Um, so I think one is, uh, you know, connecting to ancestors and elders. Uh, you know, Malcolm X uh, said, um, our greatest teachers are our history. You know, our history is our best teachers. So understanding that, like, you know, we should be looking towards um, finding femtorship, mentorship, teachings, uh, master teachers, people uh, we could learn from and get guidance and lessons from. Um, uh, and and that, and that's really uh, understanding that um, from our culture, um, you know, from you know, deeply rooted in our African culture, um, there's always been a deep relationship uh, between elders and young people. And we need to, you know, go back to that, 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 that spirit, that understanding and, 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 and living um, to really gain that kind of relationship and strongness for our movement. Um, you know, for educators, um, I would say, tell our educators, our elders, uh, you know, to dive into the struggle, to dive, you know, a little bit more into the struggle with us, with our young people, for our young people, for each other. Um, and that's really, uh, you know, giving a little bit more commitment, a little bit more out of, out of, out of the state of my regular uh, comfortability, uh, my regular comfortable um, zone. And, you know, I say that because, you know, there was a, there's moments where um, a story where I was, I was outside, you know, doing my regular rituals in the morning. Uh, and I usually see young people in my park who's, you know, skipping school and stuff. But, and I understand like, you know, I ain't mess with school either. And, but, and in my spirit, I was like, dang, uh, I should be communicating with them. I should be building with them, but also, there's a piece of fear with like, dang, um, you know, what if they don't, you know, they don't fuck with me? What if they don't, you know, they don't rock with that? What if like, like, like something pop or, or, or something happened? And I'm just like, yo, I need to dive into the struggle. I need to really go build with these young people in my community and just see how they doing, see what's going on. And I think um, that's what I'm saying, you know, just giving that a little bit more effort where, um, it's always needed to, to be able to, to build more relationships with our young people. Definitely, thanks so much for that. Anne? Thank you. Um, to our young people and educators and activists out there, um, I'd say like just continue being curious about everything and anything. Um, you are who you want to hear and see. Your stories, identities, and every part of you definitely matters. And be your own leader. Uh, keep and break away from what you need or don't need. Um, uplift and acknowledge others um, who keep you grounded in this work. Um, Connections may grow or break, but remember it's okay to not like feel everything is going as planned, but definitely find your ground and observe from there. 
um, dive into your roots, uh, facing these systems that need to be broken down cannot bring you down with them. Um, and while learning and adapting to change and cultivate, cultivating with youth power and all the works, and it's definitely all about, like I said earlier, like listening and demanding, um, sharing experiences, um, don't be afraid to speak out, having resilience and determination. Um, as you surround yourself with more young people and adult allies, um, educators, chosen family, friends, and loved ones um, that will truly support you and also believe in what young people can do for our world, it definitely will keep the fire burning and go for what is unmeasurable until we reach deserved liberation that we all need. Thank you. Definitely, thanks. So Thanks so much for that, and thanks for those reminders. Ja'Kayla? Thank you. My advice to the young people who are or who are looking into being an activist when it comes to abolition or just activism in general, I feel, number one, it's something that you definitely need to find your own personal connection to. Activism is something that can totally take a toll on you, specifically because you do have a personal connection with it, although it's very important for you to find that personal connection because that is what's going to keep that fire burning with inside of you. And that's what's going to make you take this as seriously as you should, because like we've all been mentioning, it's life changing work and it's something that is going to be beneficial for all of us moving forward. Self-care is another main thing that I do stress because I feel like as adults and uh, doing this work, I come across a lot of people doing a similar work as me, but they don't necessarily have, I'm also guilty of this, they don't necessarily have a very well-rounded self-care regimen, whether it be spend a whole day not thinking about what you're doing for your activism project or getting an hour to yourself to just read a book that's not related to the work that you're doing or just simply giving yourself a pat on the back for your small and, and or big wins. Self-care is very important because I feel like if you don't fully take care of yourself and fully understand what your needs are, then you aren't going to be able to perform at your full capacity when it comes to attempting to go out and represent not only your needs, but the needs of others like you. Last but certainly not least, when it comes to educators and or facilitators or adults who are interested in being supportive or joining activism within abolition on their own and working with young people, it's very essential to work with young people. And then two, to go along with that, it's very important for you to know that this work is not going to stop with you and to know that you are not the deciding factor when it comes to doing this work with younger people. Your Our viewpoints are very much so needed and us being adults can help the youth get into more doors and be seen by more audiences that they probably would not have been able to get access to just as a whole entire group of young people. Although it is very, very important to know your role, like I just said, because with us being adults in this space, we are demonstrating to the younger people what it is that we feel like came, a success, came out successfully from us doing this work from as long as we've been doing. And we're feeding that to them for them to develop their own framework of what it looks like to successively collectively um, activated against abolition. And then certainly this is the major important part. Don't let anybody tell you that your vision for abolition is something that could not be or something that is just catastrophic to what can actually happen because it definitely can happen. Everything can happen that you personally feel like number one, you have a personal connection to. Two, you have your self-care regimen, meaning you know yourself and you know your needs. And then three, if that adult or um, other figure is coming in to help support or would like to support within this battle or this journey that we're on, know your place and also self-care. Everybody needs to know their self and their needs in order for us to go out and to replicate what it is that we need and the rest of our community needs because all of that plays a part into the work that we are doing. 
Definitely. Thank you so much for that. And I hope that folks listening are taking heed to those lessons. Brother Caleb. Thank y'all so much. And yeah, I'm definitely writing down some notes from uh, my fellow comrades here. I just want to thank y'all for uh, this night. It has been amazing. Um, lessons I'll give to uh, young folk, uh, educators, uh, community members, parents um, who want to support young folk. I, first, I just want to thank folk, right? I think that we live in a time where it is um, it is easier to be naive. It is easier to be um, stupid about what's happening around us. Um, but the fact that you are already um, stepping into that process and that, um, of learning about what you can do and how you can serve community and serve this, uh, this project of freedom um, is amazing. So I, I just wanna thank you for that. And, and just to echo, yes, we definitely need to take care of ourselves. We're still living through a public health uh, a crisis. Um, capitalism is a crisis. Education is a crisis. Um, everything is a crisis right now. Um, and care, care for ourselves and our communities um, and for our people and um, ourselves is what's going to bring us uh, uh, closer to that, that line of freedom. Um, I think that for educators, I definitely want educators to, to really reflect on how they've shown up in spaces with young folk and how much autonomy they've given young folk. I think that supporting young folk um, through a schooling process that is linked to the same systems that we are seeking to uh, abolish won't work unless you are having critical engagement with young folk. Um, I think that um, we all must reflect on how these systems that we seek to abolish, um, where do they live within us, right? Where does patriarchy, where does militarism, where does anti-Blackness, where does homophobia, um, where does xenophobia live within me? Um, and, and that space, in that conversation, in that, that, that fight um, in myself, I'm also helping fight uh, the presence of those systems outside of uh, my physical body. Um, I think that um, our task is not perfection, our task is revolution, right? Um, and revolution, we, we throw that word around lightly, but revolution has always been bloody. <laughs> revolution is not fun. Revolution will take time, energy, and commitment to masses of people and mobilizing ourselves and each other to caring for each other enough uh, to fight for a, a better day. Um, so how are you preparing for revolution? Um, there's an old African saying that a shield cannot be built in a time of war. Um, how are you building your, uh, your shield now? And look, you can look around where some might already say that we're in a time of, uh, of, of war, um, but understanding that this struggle is a long-term struggle, that um, we've been here before, um, that uh, our ancestors and elders have seen this before, um, that yes, the master may have new tools and new gadgets, um, but they still can't beat our old fashioned energy um, and collective institutional building um, with each other. Um, it's gonna look pretty some days, some days it's gonna be hard, um, but as long as, as long as we're in that struggle together, um, and we're doing the work, that we're doing the reading, that we're listening to our elders, that we're calling our ancestors in the room, that we're making sure that we listen to the folks who are at the margins of our society and our own communities, um, and always thinking about what can I do, what skills do I bring to this movement, not just the theoretical, not just the communications and put in the posts on Facebook and Twitter, but what are those hard skills um, do you need to know how to garden? <laughs> do you need to know how to take care of folk? What skills are you bringing to this fight for freedom and to the revolution? Because we're going to need everyone. We're going to need us all. So I thank y'all for this night and I, I look forward to seeing y'all on the other side. Definitely. Thank you all so much for engaging us in these questions and giving your heartfelt knowledge 
to this, you are all, all reminders of our coming victory, right? And we have to believe that. So thank you all again for sharing your words. It's a way to respond and to remind folks around what it means to trust young people. Because when you trust young people, now you are being able to learn new things. The poet Gwendolyn Brooks says, working with young people reminded her that she was always in the kindergarten of her understanding. So I thank you all because I am constantly reminded of what I need to do and then how I need to listen to do those new things and some old things and to remind myself that those things have been done before. So thank you all again for that. So as we wind down, we're gonna do a little bit of a screen share and we wanna thank all the organizers and contributors to Lessons in Liberation, especially our four amazing panelists that are uh, actually shared with us today. Now, the slide that we have up says Community Padlet and reads, Share one important takeaway from tonight that you want to hold close as you integrate abolition education, abolitionist education into your teaching practice. The slide also shows the QR code to access the Padlet and the YouTube cover image of the song we'll play in a moment to close out. And it's the song Juneteenth by the Alphabet Rockers. So in the Padlet, please share one important takeaway from tonight that you want to hold close. And then go ahead, we'll put that Padlet link in the chat. And as that is um, getting in the chat now, and as folks are going into the Padlet, some have already been on the Padlet. We're gonna close out as we um, play music, but we just wanna thank you all so much for your engagement and your thoughts uh, tonight. We wanna thank our panelists who were so fire and so fierce. Um, in sharing their stories and also their thoughts with us today. Um, thank you to our team working behind the scenes to make this event run so smoothly. If you do wanna rewind or rewatch or share today's panel, it will be available on YouTube and on the Facebook pages of Critical Resistance and the Free Minds, Free People site um, of the Education for Liberation Network. We also would love for you to join us and spread the word about our upcoming webinar um, on school leadership, which is gonna be on November 16th, featuring Sagnite Salazar, Emily Bautista, Jen Johnson, Talia T.L. Lewis, and you can register now. Um, the link will be in uh, the chat as well. So just stay tuned for a follow-up email with opportunities for engagement and resources. And we just want to thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you. And we are just so excited to continue this work um, collectively. So we're going to go ahead and go back to the Padlet. We will play a song by Youth Versus Apocalypse. Um, and I think we'll go right to it now. And there we go. Thanks, y'all. Are you born with it? Is it God given? Or is there a cost to be free? The Constitution said we were three fifths human. How can it be? Democracy built on stolen land. Freedom is a right, not a privilege. Freedom from false restrictions. Skin color, birthplace, respect the ways we're all different. Let's take it back about a hundred years. Quick, let me paint this picture. America in a civil war, no Marvel movie, this history. President Lincoln had a plan to end slavery only in the South. But black folks, when they heard about it, start spreading that word of mouth. Picked up arms and joined the Union to fight for their own freedom. The colored troops helped win the war, gave the proclamation new meaning. Yeah, you better believe it. Do you know the story of Juneteenth? When the enslaved found out that they were free. Two years after 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation. 
justice When have we seen it and known it? Who are the ones who have grown it? Took it from notion to showing what's up Let's talk about soldiers who were free Risking their lives for people like me All the camp folk they may never know Took a lead that we all could follow Following the call for what? Justice Figured the land it was for the enslaved When you think about this proclamation The emancipation is knowing that we were the brave 200,000 soldiers organizing Women and children home strategizing Paid for protests, learned to address The power of truth and the culture uprising Do you know the story of Juneteenth? Freedom is not individual, it's collective. Can't stop that joy. Freedom is not individual, it's collective. Freedom is not individual, it's collective. Freedom is not individual, it's collective. Freedom is not individual. Freedom is not individual. Freedom is not individual. When you think about Juneteenth, remember how we freed ourselves, how we stayed prepared. We will prevail, cause we tip the scales, closing all the jails, and we will not fail. You believe, you dream, you move, you serve for those who pass for our culture. No one left behind. Be sure. We stand, we rise, we on that joy ride. We stand, we rise, we on that joy ride. We stand, we rise, we on that joy ride. We on that joy ride. Let's go, 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 let's go,